So this week we're going to thank you. Um, nice job. This week we are going to be in our second week of our, um, I guess we'll call it our series right now, on the greater challenge. We're going to be talking about the greater challenge. And the greater challenge this week is going to be looking at the, the idea of understanding. And the one thing that jumped out at me with this passage that we're going to read, and we're going to be in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 16. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Um, but the one thing that jumped out at me, as parents, how often do you look at your kids? Or if you don't have kids, you remember when you were a kid and you had parents, and you do something, and your mom or your dad look at you and say, you know, you should have known better than that, right? You should have known better than that. Right? We say that all the time. And, I, and, I, and for some reason, and you'll see this, I think, as we read through this part of, of Scripture, I feel like Jesus is telling a teacher in the law, a teacher of the, of the faith, you should have known better. Right? So we're going to be in John chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 16 if you want to follow up with me. Starting at verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let us bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for this opportunity to come together to study your word. Lord Jesus, please fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Let it fill each and every person here. That it fills our heart to soften it to your truth. That it fills our ears to hear your truth. And that it fills our minds to accept your truth. So that we can learn it and love it and live it. And we ask for this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So the author, J.R.R. R. Tolkien, who's the guy who wrote the, the Lord of the Rings series, it's probably his most famous one, The Hobbit and all those things, he had a quote once that said, not all those who wander are lost. Not all those who wander are lost. And that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, we can be out there searching and looking, but not necessarily lost. I mean, we can be. There's been times, and I know this is weird. I know my kids at least think this is very weird. But growing up and going to Italy all the time when I was a kid, um, the cars over there did not have air conditioning, and they did not have stereos. So in the summer, we would drive a lot with our windows down and no music. And I've actually grown to like the sound of just driving without the radio. I enjoy it, being out on the road. I like that kind of stuff. Now there are times though where I'm driving and I know I gotta get somewhere and I don't feel like plugging it into the GPS. So once in a while I'll do stuff like, well, I know where I'm going is west of here so I'll just start driving west and eventually I'll run into something that I know, right? In fact, I was so proud. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's happenstance <coughs> that this happened. I think I dropped something off at Bill's house, who's here today, just by chance. 
I think I dropped something off there, and we had to go towards camp. And I didn't feel like plugging it in. And Lord goes, do you know where you're going? I said, no, I'm just going to start driving the place that I know I'm going to hit a road at some point that I'll recognize. And I did. And I was so proud of myself that I found it without having to plug it into my phone just by kind of driving west, right? But there are times, though, when we are wandering and we're absolutely lost. There are times when we're wandering and we're absolutely lost. Lost beyond comprehension. Brothers and sisters, in the text that we just read, we're talking about a man who was completely lost. And it's surprising that he was so completely lost. Because here we have a very religious man. Someone who should have known where he was going. In fact, it would be like having a, an address plugged into your GPS and still having no idea where you're heading. That was, that's what was going on here. But once this man met Jesus, he began to question the directions that he had been given. In fact, he began to question the reality of everything that he had grown up believing. So let's get a little bit of context here and a little bit of background. So who's this Nicodemus character? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. These, the Pharisees, were very religious people. They were teachers. They were enforcers of the church, for lack of a better word. In fact, the Pharisees as a group were part of the in crowd in church. They were part of the in crowd. They were Jews. They were Hebrews. They were God's chosen people. Anybody who wanted to be seen as pure or righteous or a cut above the rest wanted to be either a part of the Pharisees or in the good graces of the Pharisees. In fact, the Pharisees were so dedicated to being pure and righteous that they were often <coughs> referred to as the pious ones. Those are the pious ones. Their name, or the name Pharisee, actually comes from the Hebrew word parash, which means to separate from. Which means to separate from. You see, they separated themselves from anything or anyone who they deemed to be impure. They refused to have anything to do with any kind of sinner. But in particular, they had a penchant for disliking tax collectors and prostitutes, and most of all, those dirty, disgusting Gentiles. They did not like the Gentiles at all. In fact, in Luke chapter 18, verse 11, Jesus tells the parable of the Pharisee. Who, took, who stood in the temple and prayed this wonderful prayer. And he thanked God for all the things he did. And he ended up by saying, and thank God that I'm not like all of those other people. Because you see, that man was committed to being separated from anyone that wasn't pure. In fact, the Pharisees were so righteous and so religious that everyone around them was in awe. And they loved that. They loved that. Everyone around them was in awe of that. Except for one particular person. Jesus. Jesus was not particularly fond of the Pharisees. He was absolutely not in awe of them. Because you see, Jesus made the Pharisees uncomfortable. And the Pharisees didn't like Jesus much either. So the feeling was mutual. Because you see, Jesus repeatedly condemned them for their hypocritical self-righteousness. Self -righteousness. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 14, listen to some of the descriptions that Jesus uses here for the Pharisees. In Matthew 15, 14, he said, they are blind leaders of the blind. They are blind leaders of the blind. This is one of my favorite ones. Matthew 25, 15, he wrote, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win over one convert. And when they're won over, you make them twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Powerful. Powerful. In Matthew 23, Jesus condemned them by saying, You are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside you are full of dead men's bones and uncleanliness. That one particularly spoke to me. 
It particularly spoke to me. You see, about two years before my grandfather passed away, my grandparents had a wish that they did not want to be buried underground when the time came that they passed away. So they made my dad promise that he would get some kind of mausoleum for them that was above ground. So they had this thing completed about two years before my grandpa. We didn't know when my grandpa was passing. My dad just had it, had it done, right? And I remember my dad being so proud of this mausoleum and taking pictures of it and sharing it with me. And, and my dad would say, Vince, you don't look happy about it. I said, Dad, I never want to see that picture. And he said, why? It's beautiful. I said, it's beautiful. Grandpa's dead body is going to be in there one day. There's nothing beautiful about that. Unless you're only worried about the outside and not worried about the inside. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were worried about the outside, but they weren't worried about the inside. As you might imagine, brothers and sisters, this did not make Jesus popular with the Pharisees at all. But keep in mind that this did not apply to all the Pharisees. Nicodemus wasn't quite so sure, and he wasn't quite convinced that Jesus was wrong. He was actually skeptical, which is why he came to him. And so it, become, it starts, as we read, to Jesus, he came by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. Now notice, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. And he came to him at night so that he would be under cover, so that he would be under darkness, because he was still a Pharisee. And if he was seen with Jesus in public, it could ruin him. And so he seeks Jesus out at night when he can ask his questions quietly, when he can ask his questions in private. But notice what Jesus does when Nicodemus comes to him. Jesus doesn't just let Nicodemus ask his questions. Jesus cuts right to the heart of the matter by declaring to Nicodemus, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this is kind of an odd statement, right? It's kind of an odd and jarring statement. What exactly is Jesus telling Nicodemus when he says that? Brothers and sisters, Jesus is telling Nicodemus this. He's saying, Nicodemus, it's time for a change. It's time for a change, and things are no longer the same. You've grown up thinking your religion is right, but it's not, and it's time to be born again. And Nicodemus, at this point, he's confused. And he's right to be confused. And you can see that he just doesn't get what Jesus is saying to him. Because Nicodemus responds, how can a man be born again when he's old? What is he going to do? Enter into his mother's womb for a second time? And remember, you know, we laugh at this a little bit, but Nicodemus was not an idiot. This was a schooled person. This was an educated person. This was a revered teacher in the community. And he hears Jesus and he goes, well, I'm supposed to crawl back up inside and be born again. He doesn't, he doesn't understand it. Brothers and sisters, this is really weird. And it's really odd. And the reason why it's weird and odd is because this should not have been a shock to Nicodemus. Because being born again shouldn't have been hard for Nicodemus to understand because the Jews used that kind of verbiage and used that kind of phraseology all the time when it came to Gentiles converting to Judaism. In fact, according to the Encyclopedia Judaica, which is a big encyclopedia commentary kind of thing, it says this, the Jewish rabbis declared that a Gentile converting to Judaism, a Gentile converting to Judaism, terminates all former family ties upon conversion and is considered, in quotes, a newly born child. The Jews were already doing this. If you read Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, which is a really old and, and well-respected commentary, it says the Jews were accustomed to say of a Gentile convert on their public admission into the Jewish faith by baptism that they were a newborn child. But our Lord here extends the necessity of a new birth to Jew and Gentile alike. He extends it to everyone. They should have already known. Nicodemus should have already known. In other words, a Gentile who changed his religion and became Jewish was considered a newborn child. They were literally considered born again. So Jesus, 
in saying this to Nicodemus was aiming right at Nicodemus's heart. When he said, do not, because Jesus replied when he said, should a person be born again, go, up, go back into their mother when they're old? And Jesus said, do not marvel at what I said to you. You need to be born again. He's essentially saying, Nicodemus, what did you understand? You've got to change your religion because what you have believed is wrong. It has changed. And this can be viewed as a hard thing to say, right? It's hard. It can make folks uncomfortable. The idea that someone's religion or that someone's church might be wrong. If you look at our woke society, it seems so judgmental. It seems so difficult to say that. But brothers and sisters, that does not make it any less true. It doesn't make it any less true. Now you might be wondering exactly what was wrong with Nicodemus' religion. What exactly was wrong with Nicodemus that Jesus said this to him? Well, let's start with the basics. First off, the Jews at this point had made their own rules. They had made their own rules. They had gotten into the habit of not appealing directly to Scripture. Instead, they now appealed to their own rule book. They had their own set of directions on how to obey God. Because they didn't think that God was explicit enough in his command. So they decided, you know what, we're just going to help out God a little bit. Just as an example of what they were thinking, they literally created a list of over 1,500 rules and regulations on how not to break the Sabbath. So Jesus, so God says, honor the Sabbath and don't do any work. And the Jews went on to make 1,500 rules on top of that. Right? But here's the thing. None of those rules, none of those regulations were in the Mosaic Law. They were in the Bible. But that did not stop them from using their creative imagination. And this is the stuff that absolutely grinded Jesus' gears. You guys are making up rules that I never gave you. Why? In Matthew chapter 15, starting at verse 7, it says, Jesus addressed the Pharisees and said, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines and the commandments of men. Not of God, of men. Their rules were the doctrines of men. And such rules made and rendered their worship in vain. It made their worship empty. It made their worship worthless. And most of all, God hated it. God hated it. Brothers and sisters, it's not just the Pharisees who fall into this trap. It is not just the Pharisees who fall into this trap. It could literally happen to anyone. And I'm going to bring up some examples of how we can see it today. And I'm going to be an equal opportunity. I'm spreading the love. So if you don't hear yours called out, you'll hear it, I'm sure. But let's take the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church that I came out of, that I grew up in, and that I still have much love for. But they specify that the authority of their doctrine comes in three ways. First, there's the Pope, who in matters of the church speaks on behalf of God and has people of validity. Then there's the tradition of the church. And then there's the Bible. In that order. In that order. So if the Bible seems to contradict either a papal decree or the tradition of the church or of a church council, then you've obviously misunderstood something in the Bible. Because in that structure, the decision of mortal men is always going to trump what the Bible says. And that's a scary place to be. This is why, for the next 40 days, they can't eat meat on Friday. But I can. And that's all right. Because that's not in the Bible. All right? Now, I don't want to just beat up on the Catholic Church, and I'm not going to just beat up on the Catholic Church. That's not right. Let's talk about the Protestant churches and the other denominational churches where folks make up rules, right? Rules like, you can't wear a hat in church. You tell me where that's in the Bible. You can't wear jeans. Or women have to wear dresses. Or you're not supposed to have electric instrumentation in the church. Only a piano. 
or no eating and drinking in the sanctuary. I almost fell over the other day. I had someone, a friend, on Facebook challenge me, <laughs> challenge me over the inappropriateness of drinking coffee in church. It's like, where? It's disrespect. I said, since when? I said, do you don't know? Don't hide your cups. I got my I'll get the water now. I brew that coffee that's back there. I want you guys to drink it. But the reality is, are we forgetting what happened? I mean, the early church gathered together for a meal. And now all of a sudden there's these, these ideas that we make up. And on and on and on. Now, this isn't just one. And on and on and on. None of that stuff is in the Bible. We make it up. And then we try to enforce it. Brothers and sisters, hear me when I say this. Hear me when I say this. Scripture is all you need. Scripture is all you need. Just like we talked about last week about overcoming temptation. What did Jesus use to overcome temptation? Scripture, the word of God. That is all he used to overcome temptation. The scripture is sufficient for teaching and correcting and for training in all righteousness. It's all you need to be complete and fully equipped to serve God. You do not need people to make up additional rules and doctrines because it ends up making your worship vain, empty, and worthless, and it's a trap. And it's a trap. But you know, this trap could happen to all of us, and it can happen to any church, any church that's serious about believing in the Bible. You have to rely on it 100% that the Bible is inherent, that it is infallible, and that is authoritative. So in one of the groups that I've been on Facebook, and I'm in a bunch of groups. I'm in a bunch of groups like, you know, Dutch Theologians Fan Club, and, uh, <laughs> the Reformed Coffee House, and all these things that I've had. I was reading this one post the other day, and a person shared that they had a deacon at their church who was really angry about the fact that children were taking communion as it was passed down the aisles. Now, I understand why this guy was upset. The Lord's Supper is an important sacrament, and it is an observation that we do as part of worship, and it's serious, and it's somber, and it should not be mistreated or regarded as trivial. Communion is our time to remember the Lord's sacrifice for us. But there's a big problem with what this guy's upset about. Because as seriously as we regard communion, there is nowhere in Scripture, nowhere where God commands us to police the communion table. <coughs> it is just not there anywhere. In my view, and I opine this way, if a child is old enough to understand and to know who Jesus is, then they're certainly old enough to participate in communion. And as you read the scripture, I want you to ask yourself this one thing. Could you imagine, if you read and understand the scriptures, could you imagine, would your understanding lead you to believe that Jesus would turn away a child that came to him with his hand outstretched asking him for a piece of bread? Could you get that from reading scripture? Because I don't read that anywhere in the scriptures. God loves little children. God loves little children. You know what God doesn't love? He doesn't love made up rules. He doesn't love rules that people make up on his behalf. But the Pharisees did not see it that way. Not only did they have their own rule book, they regarded their rules as more important than the people Jesus came to save. In Matthew 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Now tithing, tithing was and still is important. Tithing was commanded under the Old Testament law. It was not optional. It was required. But as important as giving those tithes to God is, mercy was just as important to God. Justice was just as important to God. 
And faithfulness was just as important to God. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus said, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Which, again, comes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. And there's Jesus again quoting the Old Testament. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call, the right, not to call righteous, but to call the sinners. Sacrifice was required of the Old Testament, but God regarded mercy to sinners as more important. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. Have you heard of a church that if someone engages in a certain kind of sin, regardless of what that is, will tell them there's the door? Don't let it hit you on the way out. Because we don't want your kind here. I want you to truly think about what they're saying. I want you to truly think about what that means. What kind of people are they saying they don't want in their church? They're saying they don't want sinners in their church. They don't want dirty sinners to come in, in their midst, and taint their otherwise sinless congregation. There is a big problem with that thinking, brothers and sisters. And the big problem is this that every single one of us is a sinner. We've all sinned. There's not a single one in here that is worthy of being in this place on our own. Not a single one. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why you're here. And that's why I'm here. Because you and I are the kind of people that Jesus died to save. I don't get choked up for fun. Someone asked me once if I practice it. And I don't. But there are times when I read the scripture and I truly am confronted with what God should see in me apart from Jesus that it's not only crying that I want to do, I want to just hide. I want to just hide. But thank God for our Savior. Yes. Thank God for Jesus. Understand that Jesus died to save us. But he also died so that we can become who we were meant to be. You see, being born again means exactly that. That we're born again. That we're renewed. That we're not the same. That we're not continuing on in our sin. But what, rather we're repenting. We're believing. We're changing. We're transforming. And we're becoming made more and more into the image of God. How many times have you heard people say, if you could go back to the eighth grade, would you do it? If you could go back to the fifth grade, to the second grade, to high school, would you do it? And a lot of times the answer is, I would if I could take with me what I know now then. Right? We say that sometimes. Well, guess what? When you're born again, that's your restart. That's your restart, and now you know. And now you don't have to wish for that, because it can happen now. You see, Jesus came to save sinners, and that's our objective. As a church, as a church body, we need to confront and condemn sin. But if someone has sinned and wants to change, it is on us to show mercy and justice and faithfulness, because that is what Jesus is saying here. In fact, the concept of mercy was so important that on the Sermon of the Mount, which we preached on just four weeks ago, Jesus promised, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we want mercy from God in our lives, brothers and sisters, we need to show mercy to others. Let's bring it to my last point. What does it mean to be born of water and the Spirit? That's what Jesus said. You must be born of water and the Spirit. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus here has gone from talking about Nicodemus changing his religion, being born again, to explaining the steps to achieve that. You must be born of water and the Spirit. So what does that mean? Well, the water part, Nicodemus would have understood. Because as we just discussed a few weeks ago when we talked about the baptism of Jesus, and according to the commentary that I mentioned, the Jews were accustomed to taking heathen converts for a public admission into the Jewish family by baptism, where they were being born again. In fact, to this day, when a Gentile joins the Jewish faith, they're baptized. And that's the purpose of Christian baptism, 
it, it is a, a sign of our conversion. It is a sign of our initiation into Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Paul writes, For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, we're told, Baptism, which corresponds to Noah's flood, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What baptism is, that's our outward sign of the born-again testimony that's within us. It's a symbol of our belonging to the body, that we are now a part of the body of Christ. You see, baptism is our initiation into Christ. It's where you visually for everyone put on Christ. And it is an appeal from God to follow him. And now that I'm feeling better at we're making our plans, I know that I've been promising to do a baptism uh, at some point. We're definitely going to do it. I just, I didn't want to embarrassly either need a crane or five people to lift me in and out of the water. So now that I'm getting strong enough, I can do it myself. We're going to do that here at some point. Because it is, it's just a show that we're apart. It's a show. I always remember that scene in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, right? Where those guys are walking by and there's a baptism going on and that one dude comes running, right? He, he knew what was going on. He wanted to be saved. But what about the spirit part? So that's the, the being born of water. What about the spirit part? Well, the spirit part, what Jesus is saying there, is that that is God's signature on the contract. That's God signing on the dotted line. In Ephesians, Paul writes this in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 13. Believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of your inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. Because brothers and sisters, when God places his spirit on you, he seals you. And that spirit guarantees your salvation guarantees it. When you stand before the throne of God on the last day, God's not going to be looking at your face. He is going to look for his mark on your soul. The promise of the Holy Spirit. It's almost like being branded, right? And there's some cattle be branded, and then you know that forever that cattle or sheep or whatever belongs to that farmer or whoever. When God places that seal on your heart, he knows forever that you are his forever. In fact, you can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Cannot be. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, Paul writes, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That's our mark. That's when we know. So according to what we just read, brothers and sisters, your contract for God for salvation involves two things. Be in of water and being born of the Spirit, where God promised to put His Spirit inside you. That's why at the Pentecost, when, when Peter was there and they asked, what, what must we do to be saved? What did Peter respond? Repent of your sin and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Repent and believe, <coughs> and you will receive the Holy Spirit. It was the same message that Jesus gave to Nicodemus, repeated by Peter, to all those people at the Pentecost. And here's the best part. Here's the best part. There's no second guessing here, brothers and sisters. There's no second guessing. You know, this, knowing that if you turn to Jesus, this is like the game at the, at the Portage County Fair. This is like the game with the little ducks going around in the water. It doesn't matter which duck you pick up, everyone's a winner. Every single one, you don't have to worry about it. Because every duck gets you a prize. You go there, you pull a duck, you're going to win. When you turn to Jesus, when you repent, when you believe in him, guarantee. 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 And then the work starts. And then you change. Because when you're born again, what's the implication? If you're born again, what's the implication? That you're a child again. And what do children need to do? They need to learn. And they need to grow. And that's what happens. I know Rich a lot of times give, gives people guitar lessons, right? And I know, and I used to take music lessons too. 
And you know what my music teacher used to hate about me, which is why I quit really, really soon? Oh, you guys are music majors, too. You know this. You know what music teachers hate? They really can't stand students who think they got it all figured out already. Yeah. Right? Because you can't be open to learn. You can't be open to learn. We need, once we become born again, we need to turn to Jesus. Teach me. And how are we taught? Through scripture. And at all times. The title of the sermon was understanding. Nicodemus didn't have understanding at the beginning of that conversation with Jesus, but he did now. And brothers and sisters, all of you need to make sure that you have understanding. Understanding that will lead to eternal life. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is Rich and Rob and Sam, if you guys want to come up. I'm going to do something. We're going to do a call to the altar. We're going to do a call to the altar. And this is what the call is going to be for.